Thank you for the warm welcome and welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today at our panel where we will delve into the role of transparency in, uh, in the, and how it impacts reputations today. So we would like to welcome again our very, very distinguished panelists. Thank you for joining us today. Our eminent guests, colleagues, and of course, my dearest students. Now, Dean Guha has already provided us with an incredible perspective on the importance of ESG today. Let's think a little bit more about it. Now, those of you who know me well, my friends, my colleagues, and of course, my long-suffering students, know that numbers and I don't always get along. We really aren't the best of friends. And the moment I see a spreadsheet, I tend to break out in a cold sweat. Yeah, that's me. And I work in marketing. So, yeah, you guys will understand what a challenge that can be. But no matter how cold they leave you, there are certain numbers the world just cannot afford to ignore anymore. Numbers like 4.6 billion. That's the number of human beings around the world who are already living in areas that are impacted by climate change. Numbers like 250,000, which is the additional deaths which will be caused every year between 2030 and 2050 from factors which are directly attributed to climate change. Numbers like 2.4 billion, which is the number of people worldwide who are facing food scarcity, which means, and this is the bit which amongst others really leaves me cold, 29.4% of the world's population goes to bed hungry every single night. And for other numbers, to shock and scare, 70%. 70% is the number of countries worldwide which have reported an increase in discrimination in various forms in the past two years. Two years itself. Now, in the middle of all of this doom and gloom, and you're wondering that why is our Radha ma'am over here and you know trying to lecture us again, I promise there are rays of hope, not just glimmers, but rays of hope. Just last month, for example, the United Nations Secretary General convened a conference on climate action, and he recognized the first movers and doers. Now, who were these? These are leaders around the world who have not just taken pledges, but who have made direct implemental plans and have taken action to promote decarbonization of our planet. Environmental and social governance never should have been, and it definitely isn't, a nice to have. It is directly impacting our ability to build and sustain businesses and grow brands. 80% of global companies, leading global companies worldwide are saying that climate change is impacting their ability to do business. Hearteningly, 74% of consumers around the world are saying they will not give their business to organizations which fail their employees, their communities and the planet through their policies and the manner in which they do business, which means that we are already in an age where transparency is going to be essential for survival. Now, how has this been panning out and how has this journey happened? Now, those are questions that we are very, very fortunate to have an extremely eminent panel of experts with us to decode. We are going to crack the ESG code open and understand how this is impacting brand loyalty, brand resonance, your future, our future together. Please join me in giving our panel another round of applause and a warm ISH welcome.
Rajiv, I'm going to start my panel with you. I'm going to start the question. You have been reporting on environmental social governance frameworks for several years now. How have you seen these conversations changing? And when did you start seeing these conversations entering the mainstream? And in your experience as a senior journalist, is there a dichotomy or are the industry and what the consumers want in tune on ESG governance? Thank you very much. Thanks for the invite. I'm really pleased to be here and it's great to talk to students, the future generation actually. And I can also see the mere fact that we're here, the topic is AG, the change is already shaping to the uh, levels which is going to future, going to make us future ready actually. That's very important. And so it's a very compliment to the faculty, students and of course those who have thought about the idea, I'm sure it's the collective effort here. And uh, Second thing is that you know, this is uh, one inflection point that is coming to this level, but stepping back a bit. While the EAG is what we know for the last decade and a half, actually, but it has been indirectly, directly, there in different forms all through. And I would go back uh, quite a bit that if we talk about charity, philanthropy in India, you can also link it forward. And only the nomenclature has been changing, the dynamics have been changing, but the core has remained always the same. And coming to the basic taxonomy bit of it, which is more important, that I would also give a bit of, la bit of a larger perspective and do stop me when I run out of time, please. Because that will be useful for students because it's a maze out there. AG, if we look at in India, it started, say, in 2009 or so. We started with voluntary uh, corporate guidelines. Then it evolved into something called voluntary EAG, but it, uh, it was not EAG per se, it was environment, social and economics. Then it grows into responsibility bit. And then finally we have had BSR and then BRSR subsequently, which was more recent. And simultaneously the scope has been widening, which is like from 100 companies to 500 companies to 1000 companies. And till recently it was voluntary, now it has become, it has become mandatory. And also now there is a third party assurance also building it. So those are the uh, uh, layers under it which are shaping the future discourse. That's the Indian part of it. But you have to locate it in the global context also, which is very important. Globally and uh, formally at least, it begins in 2004. It began in 2004 when there was a UN report called Who, who, uh, who Cares Wins. Now that set the really foundation of this EAG discourse globally. And then, of course, there is a plethora of legislation, uh, not legislation to begin with, there are frameworks and standards, which kept on being used interchangeably. If you do a bit of Googling, you'll figure out uh, that the same thing is referred to at one place as a standard, at the other place as a framework. To simplify it, there are four levels globally. One is the legislation. Europe has its own legislation. USA has its own legislation. And India also has BRSR, as you would know, it's own legislation. So countries have their own legislation so also. So there's a bit of an overlap here. So you you mostly hear about CDP, which is Carbon Disclosure Project. You'll hear about GRI, Global Reporting Initiative. And there are a host of such instruments in place. But at Glasgow, UN conference, they decided that, okay, let's try to standardize it globally so that nations can also probably align with it. So then we had financial reporting framework which also started working on ISSB which is International Standards uh, Board, Sustainability Board and they started merging all these framework, uh, framework standards together into something called their own sustainability framework and standards and they come out with two of those for, uh, for infrastructure and uh, I think for uh, financial sector right now. So this is the larger global framework. That's how it all began, begins. But having said that, ESG is a very cross-cutting kind of a thing. Now, ESG doesn't impact only the financial sector or any other sector. It's a very cross-cutting thing. What I have also seen is, you have more recently, Advertising Society of India also stepping into it because there's lots of greenwashing happening. So you have other parallel organizations also stepping into it. So that's a larger matrix. But the conversation really uh, coming back to what you said, conversations really took off in India with, with India became the first country to be CSR mandatory. Now that was a turning point globally in India also. 
Till the Netherlands have done a good work, but India made it mandatory 2% of it, which is what really changed the conversation towards from towards responsibility, <coughs> CSR, and then finally it has come into now sustainability. Stop here before. <laughs> <laughs> no, this year, this that was perfect, actually. Thank you. Thank you for providing that perspective. And uh, thank you, Jodi. Anjali, I have a question for you. You have a very robust framework which is centered on people, planet, culture, and community. What was the thought process behind developing this program? What has been the guest response to it? And also very, very crucial for our hospitality industry, what has been the guest involvement in the process? So first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I think ISH is something that we I close very, uh, I hold very close to my heart, uh, and I've seen this institute grow from the time that this building or even the concept came about. So it's a pleasure to be here, and I think um, uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, today's session, which is all centered around ESG. Um, is something that uh, the students have taken upon themselves and organized because I think today sustainability is not a nice to have. It is uh, at the core of everything that we do and uh, that really formed the basis of our ESG strategy. Uh, we've been working on it for the last two years and uh, I must admit that uh, over the last two years it has evolved from what we had originally thought it out to be. Uh, we wanted to define pillars that are true uh, and make uh, uh, resonate with what our brand really stands for but also what resonates with our audiences and uh, thereby I mean, I think Rajiv, you mentioned about and touched upon greenwashing. We didn't want to do greenwashing. Uh, so we wanted to pick on three or four things and then develop them holistically uh, in an integrated approach um, in a manner that these were tangible guest experiences where guests could participate. And that's how people, planet, culture and community came about. Um, I'll start with uh, people and I'll briefly touch upon each of these. Um, for people, we are a people-centric uh, industry, we all know that. Um, and our uh, industry has very, very unique challenges. I mean, there is diversity and inclusion, there is equity in the kitchens, there is working with uh, women-only organizations, and actually these three are uh, what we based our people's strategy on. Um, during uh, uh, Women's Day this year, we launched a campaign called Leela Empowers Her, which was actually uh, the starting point of our people initiatives. We didn't want to start communicating around our initiatives until we uh, were confident that we had uh, data to back up what we were doing and our guests could relate to what uh, we were doing. And that's why we've, we've not really gone out there and started our full-blown communication. But uh, over the next couple of weeks and months, you will see this evolve. And 2024 is really going to be our year of communication around uh, our ESG initiatives. Um, when we launched Leela Empowers Her, we touched upon the three things. The first part of the campaign was I Am Leela, which was about diversity and inclusion in our own um, organization and how we nurture talent. Uh, I think ISH has been a partner for LEAD. You can see the amount of women who have participated in LEAD and it was the idea was to develop future leaders and women leaders who could take on larger responsibilities uh, uh, within the organization. The second part of it was Chef Satalila. Many of the students here may be aware of that where um, our objective was to promote equity in the kitchens and we know that as an industry that is a challenge that we all face. There is only 2% women in the kitchens when we all cook at home um, and we wanted to create that platform. Uh, I'm happy to say that when we launched this campaign, we saw every brand emulating it and it was, it was really encouraging to see how the industry embraced that thought. Not a single brand left out and they all started promoting women chefs. The idea behind our campaign was to collaborate with somebody like Rupali Dean, who's a well-known um, well in the food uh, industry. 
and bring in chefs, Indian chefs, Indian women chefs who've made it big on a global platform and use their experiences, their challenges uh, and have them narrate their story uh, to our chefs and aspiring chefs industry-wide so that these, they could be inspired to embrace um, kitchen as, um, an, a, as a career option. And the third part of it, which was Leela empowers her, was to work with women-only organizations. Um, and uh, the tea that you see at the Leela hotels come from an estate called Jalinga Tea Estate in the Northeast, where we have 90% of the uh, workforce there is women. Um, the laundry bags that you see in our hotels are made by Jodhpur Mahila Grahe Udyog, which is a completely 100% women-run NGO. Um, the, um, uh, uh, you know, our bath amenities, which are manufactured by Kimerica, has an 85% women workforce. We're about to launch a beautiful collaboration where um, our flowers that we use in our hotels are going to be upcycled into creating incense sticks, which are infused um, by our signature fragrance. 95% of the workforce there is women. Um, so we looked at organizations like these that we could uh, partner with and thereby make a meaningful difference to what we believed our people's strategy should be. And it was not about just us. It was about our community. It was about our culture. Um, and here is just one example how how people was brought to life. Uh, briefly touching upon planet, um, we are all very, very much aware of the fact that um, uh, LED bulbs or doing away with plastic in the rooms or using only glass water bottles. These are no more things that one needs to talk about. I think if brands are not doing that, they really need to go back and think about what they're doing. Our challenge was how do we take it a step further? And that's why the whole concept of circular economy, that's why the whole concept. Of, I mean, many of you may have watched um, uh, Pariniti's wedding at the Leela Palace Sudhapur. The, the highlight of that wedding was the boats. Well, those are all EV boats. Um, and that became a huge talking point. I think every story carried that boat. So as a lifestyle organization, we made that point. Um, and it's our hotel is the only hotel that plies EV-friendly boats on Lake Pichola because that's a conscious decision we took. So how do we make that whole planet piece come to life that goes beyond organic farming or farm to table, which I've done to death in our industry? Um, the third part of it was um, communities. I mean, we uh, had launched a campaign around Icons of India, which was collaborating with India's finest who are the world's best. And the idea behind that campaign actually started off when we were voted the world's best brand. Uh, and then we said, let's take community as a piece. And we looked at Kailash Satyarthi, Nobel Peace Laureate, and we've adopted 11 Bal Mitra Grams, which are child-friendly villages, because children are, again, something that is close to our heart and we believe in. Uh, and we now work with children who have been rescued from child labor, from child abuse, and from child marriage. Uh, and we support their integration into a society through our collaboration with uh, <coughs> LHG. Uh, what is interesting is also how are you taking this to the second part of your question into tangible guest experiences. Uh, our guests can volunteer here. Uh, we have Masimo Batura the world's number one chef, do an activation with us here in India. We took him to one of these ashrams. Uh, he visited one of these child-friendly villages and he adopted two children. And now on a weekly basis, he's told his butler to give an update on these two children. Uh, these are real human stories. Just last week, uh, we had uh, the Travel and Leisure Global Advisory Board with us. These are 20 A-listers who drive business worth billions of dollars around the world. And we were on a, a, an immersive journey through India, and they were visiting us, uh, and they were pretty impressed, and we took them through some of these experiences and had them participate, and they realized that there is no other brand which is doing this on a global level, where a guest can actually, and this is not greenwashing, these are actual tangible experiences, and they got to interact with them and see that this was real. 
Um, I think culture, as an Indian brand, which is the epitome of true Indian luxury, we wanted our culture and to preserve our culture and communicate that in the best way possible. So whether it's through our uh, in-residence artist programming or a partnership and collaboration with Aman Elayan where we do uh, private concerts with them or a concept like the ceremonial rituals that takes place every evening across our hotels. It creates a unique sense of place and introduces our culture and provides our local artists a platform um, to showcase what India really is all about. And I think that's how our um, the social and environment piece of uh, everything that we do at Lila has been brought to life. The governance piece, uh, and I want to briefly touch upon that, is a given. I mean, as part of Brookfield, we are a Brookfield-owned company. Um, I think we have no choice. We just have to be transparent in our reporting. That's the way that we do business. We don't communicate that because it's intrinsic to who we are and what we do as much. But at some point in time, I think we are going to evolve to a level where we are able to communicate this as well. That all sounds incredible as if we needed any more reasons to stay at Leela Properties. Well, we've got a whole lot more in addition to the ones that were already there. So we know we'll be planning our next holidays. Thank you. And for my young students here, the initiative we just heard about, about upcycling the flowers. This is not even hot off the presses. This still has to get to the presses. So you heard about this for the first time in a public forum, even before it gets to the press. So thank you for sharing that. I was hoping to be able to bring a few of these boxes today, but unfortunately, they've just arrived this morning. But I'll make sure that you get to see them. Um, and actually would love your feedback on what you think about this. Thank you for that. <laughs> Hima, question on the basis of a shared pen point. Mine historic, yours current. Now, I've spent a greater part of my career in the media entertainment industry, where, of course, and I started in the era of TV first. And we, of course, now are multi-platform. But we often had these allegations of promoting the couch potato syndrome leveled at us and that's something that I've battled a lot right and then that's a struggle for the gaming industry today on the other hand you at Bazi Games have started the Bazi Sports Foundation where you are actually promoting an active lifestyle promoting excellence in sports and encouraging young people to go outside why start something like this, which some would say is actually counterintuitive to the interests of your business? Um, I, if you ask me honestly, I don't think that's the way we look at it. For us, um, the idea is to build a very strong ecosystem of um, sports-based legacy. Irrespective you played online or offline, that's how we want to take it forward. It's been nine years since this organization called Bazi Games um, is in the picture. In fact, 23rd October is when we celebrated the ninth anniversary. The whole idea is very simple. The idea is to cultivate the essence and the whole gist of what sports is all about. You know, and we try to strike a balance. That's what everybody should do. Otherwise, you cannot establish an ecosystem, especially in a country like India. So, and by the way, the games that we offer, uh, such as poker, uh, which is again a skill-based uh, sport. Uh, Rummy, again a skill-based mind sport. Uh, you play offline as well as online. Plus, uh, we are also very cautious about our future generation. So, underprivileged kids, they don't have the opportunity, uh, like some of us, to even have access to basic facilities such as a football. <laughs> so, the idea is to bring people together uh, a sense of camaraderie, sense of collaboration, and that's the whole idea of sports. Um, you are together, and in a way, it's, it's directly related to what sustainability is all about. Uh, I truly believe that when you talk about business, there's one word that comes to my mind, that's sustainability. You try to sustain the growth of your organization, you try to sustain your employees, you try to sustain your stakeholders. So sustainability is very important. And it has two levels. 
One is micro level. You talk about your own business, you talk about your own organization and profitability and all. And then there is a macro level where you talk about the environment, you talk about the consumer behavior, what's going to impact them. So the strategy should be built around that. And I truly believe the power of subconscious mind. You say something on your face and you do it something indirectly which touches the way the person is behaving. I think the second one is more impactful. You know, and as part of you know, uh, you know, being the comms person, leading the comms for the organization, the endeavor is to focus on that subconscious mind to build that kind of culture. You know, uh, sustainability will not happen if you don't have people who truly believe in it. So that way, what we're trying to do, these CSR initiatives, is to bring people together. Not just those kids, but also our employees, the potential employees. And I'll tell you why it's important. It's old word, it's, a, it's an old word, I don't know if you can relate to it, but I really love this idea called cool. You know, brand has to be cool. And in today's world, you can be cool if you are sustainable. You think about the world. I'll give you a recent example. Uh, I think many of us would know this brand called Apple. Yeah. Okay. Show of hands, anybody who doesn't? Yeah, no. We got this. Okay. So Apple has launched a new range. Uh, 15, iPhone yeah. 15. Um, you know, four devices and all. And uh, I wrote this piece um, for Men's Experience uh, publication. Now the interesting part, why I wrote this? Because I noticed something interesting. They started the sale and within four to six hours, their official stores, one in Mumbai, one in Delhi, the devices were completely off the shelf. It's not available. And you know why it happened? It's not because it's cool devices, basis the uh, aesthetics of the thing or feature it adds. It's the sustainable angle that they bring in. I'm sure many of us have seen the video where they're talking about mother nature and how they have actually pledged to be 100% or 0% in terms of recycle and carbon omission company. Now that's a cool factor. Youngsters, uh, people who are leading you know, from the front, people who are really going to bring change, they love the idea. For instance, the device that they have which is available, a, a watch, ultra watch, is 100% recycled. Now that's the cool factor. People love that thing. And I think it makes sense. So that's the whole idea. I hope I'm making sense of what I'm saying. And I hope I've answered your question. You have and uh, you've actually given me a follow-up question. Because I'm going to pick up on something you said about bringing people together. Because communities in your industry are very important, right? So is this focus on sustainability, which is also the new cool, right? So is this focus on sustainability also helping to bring player communities together? Oh, absolutely. Um, if you just um, be a little more careful, uh, sensitive, and try to enlighten the sense of, you know, you're giving back to the society, you are trying to be sustainable. I think player relations and, you know, the gaming community and the players, they really, really come forward. Um, I'll give you an example. We have this interesting property called NPS. It's basically India's largest poker series called National Poker Series. It happens every January, between January to May period. And uh, what we did last time, I think this January is to have a really gala event. And we had none other but Mary Kong coming over. Because she truly believed in the idea of skill-based sports. She said, okay, I don't, you know, no money, nothing involved. I'll just come to encourage these sports, uh, these players. Um, and going forward, our intent, we made a gala event, like really lavish. Everything exotic, beautiful, unbelievable stuff. It's been 21 years I've been working and I don't remember seeing something like that. Now the idea is to take it next step because I see a lot of players over there, they somehow directly, indirectly mention about bringing the cool factor of bringing something sustainable. Try to use recycled products when you put lights or decor. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. And I think that's where... Um, sustainability comes in really handy and if you add a bit of gamification to that which I feel is a must everything should be gamified because that way the engagement the excitement is alive so keep keeping all those things in mind I think you know the player relations uh, you know the people who are winning tournaments 
if they are more participative and encouraging that way, I think it makes a lot of sense. We are trying to do that. Let's see. Let's see. We're looking forward. We're, we're looking forward and we're following with a lot of interest. Now, one of the key things that's clearly coming out from the panel is, of course, the critical importance of an effective communication strategy when it comes to building our ESG programs. One of you worked with a diverse array of blue chip brands, including in the travel and hospitality space. On the basis of your engagement on behalf of these various brands, with these various brands, can you share some insights on how do we build an effective communication strategy? How do we reach our diverse audiences? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I can go on talking about this all day. Uh, but I think uh, just to uh, step back, um, you know, um, uh, I think for companies, uh, when I consult with them now, uh, I think uh, an effective ESG uh, strategy is not uh, something that is, you know, like a must do. It's just part of the course now. Uh, and I think to the early point about the Apple pool because of the, uh, the Mother Earth, uh, you know, uh, video, I think it's very well documented now that Gen, Gen Z is including the folks in the room today are willing to pay a greater premium for companies that are making their products more sustainable uh, and uh, essentially you know because of increasingly woke audiences uh, you know so people definitely so I think companies realize that so I think uh, uh, when from their vantage point I don't think it's just about you know being uh, uh, compliant uh, but I think it's it also makes good business sense right um, so I think there are multiple things that you know companies uh, are doing uh, today when it comes to you know ESG. I think we spoke about CSR earlier. I think that was sort of the most in its rudimentary form in terms of what you know being a good corporate <laughs> citizen looks like. But now it's a very complex environment. You know when it comes to all of those three components uh, of uh, ESG. So I think we're seeing a very uh, marked shift uh, in all types of organizations we work with, including in travel. Uh, across other uh, categories also and these are all brands such as you know uh, for example I can't speak you know for those brands I can only speak uh, as background so for example with uh, booking.com I, I think you know they're one of the most uh, uh, innovative brands in this space and they also realize that the whole credo that they have is the fact that they don't want to make just you know traveling simple for everybody but they also want to make you know, uh, uh, the whole travel experience and, and the earth as being something more enjoyable and sustainable for their uh, travelers uh, and customers, uh, you know, which led them to drive a lot of innovation around the, you know, the, you know, the travel uh, sustainability index, for example, uh, you know, which came about the fact that there was a very interesting insight that they had was the fact that in a survey they did, you know, about 76% uh, travelers said that they would like to make sustainable choices. But about 47% of them actually said, well, but we don't know how to find these uh, sustainable travel options, right? So that sort of, you know, sparked off a, uh, a framework of sorts where they identified, uh, you know, um, based on an organization called Travelist, uh, which is an independent uh, survey that uh, hosts and hotels can do, uh, which allows them to rank their, you know, place of stay or their uh, asset you know, on multiple fronts, including, you know, water consumption, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, you know, uh, for the environment, uh, uh, community, how you, how you enable more employment and things like that. So they sort of put this badge out there, which just makes it very easy for travelers to make those uh, sustainable choices. Uh, so I think, uh, and again, I think uh, to Anjali's point, you know, we saw a very robust framework across people and the planet. Similarly, in the work we've done with Accor, for example, they also have you know something called Planet Twenty One, uh, which really puts uh, you know uh, the environment center stage and people center stage, and it's really built around people, communities, and the environment. Uh, so they're working with you know, hotel owners, partners, employees uh, to essentially have more sustainable practices in hotel operations. Uh, you know, making their place of work more equitable from a uh, people perspective. Uh, and essentially, you know, making sure that they're driving very strong awareness uh, across the board. Uh, so just kind of putting it all together, I think from a communications uh, standpoint, it is uh, very vital uh, to be seen as a uh, organization that understands uh, the role they play in uh, the uh, community at large and their role, you know, for uh, what they're doing for the planet. Uh, and I think uh, just from a purely business uh, perspective, 
uh, yes, you know, I think uh, post the pandemic, which was also again a very strong trigger where consumers expect more authentic, uh, you know, um, uh, outreach from their uh, from their uh, companies or organizations. So they, I think consumers are looking for more uh, authenticity overall, and that is really driving you know a brand preference and awareness and including uh, you know making those choices uh, for sale uh, much better. So creating more brand awareness. Um, so I think that's where I sort of see this, you know, going. Uh, uh, but I think ESG is just sort of part of the course now, and, and it's going to stay that way for the longest time. And if I can just add to what Pranav said, um, I think today travelers more and more are not looking for just an escape. They are looking at making connections, making connections with the social, uh, cultural environment. Um, in places where they're traveling to. And I think each brand has to come up with those options which allow guests to be able to do that. And naturally, travelers are gravitating towards brands that are giving them this option. So just to what Pranav just said, um, it's important for brands to start taking the lead and integrating these experiences into the guest experiences because our guests are wanting it. They are demanding it. They're saying, what can I do and how does my travel impact the places and the people that I travel to? Um, and how do I interact with them? Uh, and unless we give them those options, um, I don't think we're going to be able to take the lead as we, we believe we have in the past. Well, I'm going to pick on two very important words that both of you have used, and that's community and connections. And it's really interesting what's coming out of all of these discussions is the fact that sustainability is now also about community building. It is not a flash in the pan. It is about engaging, understanding their needs. And like you guys said, a lot of it is par for the course. However, is that how everybody believes the world is going? And where are we from a public governance perspective? Adip, I would love to get your perspective on the public governance piece. Specifically first, if you could share some insights on the basis of this very extensive work you've done in the domain on are we on the same page when it comes to policy formulation and implementation? And if there are any gaps, how do you think those could be fulfilled? How could those be bridged? Are there learnings for India from other Asian markets or other global markets? Um, okay, thanks. Um, I'm audible, right? Okay, yeah. great. Um, so let me start by complimenting everyone. I think everyone's looking really sharp today. Um, <laughs> and I was quite overwhelmed walking in. I was like, okay, I hope I'm looking sharp today. Um, but yeah, uh, Anuradha, I think, you know, you've asked many questions, actually. And, and I don't know where to start. Um, I'm going to feed off the energy of my panelists and just put one more point. Uh, my fellow panelists spoke about how consumers are so now in tune and wanting sustainable products and ESG, right? I represent a number of medical device companies, right? Roche, Abbott, Johnson & Johnson. Now, these guys are making machines. Uh, which you will never know that they are, right? The CT scanners, the dialysis machines, the stuff that check your, you know, uh, blood level, so on and so forth. And they sell it to the hospitals, right? So you don't know which machine you're using. We're trying to reduce the carbon footprint, right? That's what they're trying to do. Now that will probably go into the HG report, uh, but you may not hear of it that much because you're not directly buying that. But the point that I'm trying to make is that for consumer-facing brands, it's critical, but it's become even more critical or as critical as for B2B brands. <laughs> so that's the first thing that I, I wanted to put out there. Um, I think uh, learnings from other markets, I think I look at it in terms of developed markets, developing markets, develop would be sort of Europe, US, developing would be, you know, us. Uh, a lot of markets in the Asia Pacific, like Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Japan, Korea was slot in the developed uh, sort of field. Uh, so everybody's in, in their own journey, right? And India is doing well, according to me. I think one of the things that we want to get out of this session is, is the glass half empty or half full when it comes to ESG, right? And when I look at it from an India perspective, I think it is full, uh, half. 
full. So there's always room for improvement, uh, right? And and Rajiv can qualify that uh, because I think what 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 Sevi has done is phenomenal. Uh, what worries me is that beyond the thousand companies, how does it then pan out to the larger companies, right? In terms of reporting, how does it pan out to domestic manufacturers? who sometimes, to be honest, are not, I've spent more than a decade representing multinationals and I can tell you uh, that there is a difference when it comes to ESG standards, reporting between domestic manufacturers and multinationals, right? They look at it differently. Because for ESG for multinationals is about 50, 80 countries. For domestic manufacturers is one country, India. And not every one of them is planning to go global, right? So we have to look at that. Plus you have the unorganized market as well. So I think we need to look at it at various levels, uh, but certainly there is a lot of um, effort that has been put by the government. Uh, I don't think the government has all the answers. Let me tell you, as somebody sitting with these corporations day in, day out, they don't have all the answers too. They may seem like they do, they don't, right? And the reason they don't is because if you have 10 companies sitting trying to understand what is the best way of reporting on ESG, what is the best thing to be done on ESG, you have 10 different answers. Now, how are you going to put a common standard to it? Reporting is something after. Outcomes are something after. First, you need the standards in place. Before that, you need to define how your products are going to conform to those standards. So it's a journey. It's a long journey which starts from really thinking about ESG to having your products which are sustainable to then reporting on it. Right? And if I, I just want to feed off on one comment that was made by Mark, which is very good about Apple, right? Uh, in my earlier organization, I used to consult uh, technology companies, right? And one of the things that was so interesting was we keep talking about recycling, recycling, recycling. And they said, look, Adil, we need to move away from recycling to redesign. How do you make products in the first place which can automatically be recycled? So the conversation has really gone to that level. There is a lot that India is doing that the, the world can learn from. Uh, mandatory reporting is still not there in US and China, by the way. Only 29 countries actually have mandatory reporting according to a study. So there's a lot that the world can learn from India, but there's a lot that we need to learn from other markets as well. And I think, uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's, that's where the situation is. If I can just add to Adi's point, uh, I think the reporting piece is very complex as uh, he just uh, pointed out. Uh, and I think for uh, companies going forward, and those are also in marketing and communications, it's, it's going to be a tough job to keep up and figure out what kind of reporting and metrics should be in place. But I believe there has been some moves by the um, International F uh, Financial Service Standards, IFRS, towards a ISSB. Uh, which is the International Sustainable the Service Board. Board, right? Where they're trying to make uh, uh, reporting on ESG a little more uh, sort of templatized and standardized. Uh, so I think uh, uh, companies and marketeers have to keep abreast of all of those to make sure that they are compliant from you know those kind of industry standards. So I think there is some move and some shift in you know making sure that there is a uniform reporting framework in place. But you know, uh, this is a very complex space, so I'm sure we'll keep evolving. Absolutely. I think it's the opportunity. I can't stop the reporter in me from asking. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a recent uh, KPMG survey, which of course every survey keeps on saying that more and more people want to ESG, more and more uh, stakeholders want it. But there were two interesting things there. One was that one of the biggest apprehensions CEOs have is how to communicate the ESG story. That is what they're stuck actually. Now, I have the communication experts here, mm -hmm. probably you may have some answers there. That's one part of it. Second is, of course, uh, more and more consumers want companies to be AG friendly, but at the same time, 15% <coughs> of the consumers are really concerned about the greenwashing rate. So, we can keep greenwashing out right now, but the first thing, how to communicate the age story. There are lots of stories out there. Yeah. The standards may be uh, evolving, it will take time globally in India also. Mm -hmm. Everybody is learning actually, everybody is in the same uh, bus here, but I guess the communication bit has to be a bit in the lead. So how do that? Well, I mean, I'm sure Anjali can chime in, but I'll, I'll, I'll start. But you know, you said greenwashing. I come to that later. But there's also some... I love but this, but this so also before the greenwashing, I have a question for Rajiv on how India Inc. is doing, but please, after both of your insights on this. But there's also a term called green blushing, by the way, right? 
where you said that CEOs don't know how to communicate the ESG efforts. Uh, but I think they also fear that they may be seen as a little too woke and may get some reprimand from audiences outside. So it is a bit of a challenge, you know, where are you just doing all of these things for the sake of it because you want to appease uh, customers. So as a communicator, I would advise the CEOs is that, well, first of all, no one has all the answers. This space is evolving very fast, it's very complex. And I would say that it all ties down to being transparent and candid about what efforts you've done and you live to you know those values truly. So it's not about you know uh, the CEO or corporate communications you know driving that narrative for brands outside. You have to get the support of the entire organization behind you for it to come across as really genuine and authentic, right? That's when, uh, so I think as a brand, you have to see what are those values that you align to and what kind of specific initiatives, you know, tie back to you, your making your business more sustainable and then get the heft of the company behind you. So I think the, 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 uh, the idea is to be transparent, candid, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, definitely not over communicate, but definitely communicate on where you're heading with this. I think that's what builds trust uh, amongst uh, consumers. So I think that's a very, very valid question. And honestly, um, it is not easy. And I can tell you this because for the last two years, I've been struggling with it. When do we start communicating? How do we start communicating? Do we start building our vision first and then start building on the messages? Or do we start doing what we believe is right and do it in bits and pieces and then build the larger pieces of, bring the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together? And it is a chicken and egg situation. But I think one thing that we all admit is that this is a journey. And this is a journey that we are all embarking on. We are learning as we grow. Um, and uh, it is about trust. It is about authenticity. It is about transparency uh, in order to be able to build that trust and credibility. So as long as you have stories that are real stories and you have data to back that up, it doesn't matter whether you're waiting to communicate your bigger vision and then the stories that supplement it or start communicating your stories one by one that builds your larger vision. And I think for us at the Leela, we've adopted the second part of it, which is start communicating your smaller stories bit by bit. And ultimately, you will see a pattern and you will see what the larger story needs to be. But it is a story that needs to be communicated. It is a narrative that you can't shy away from because people are asking for it. You believe in it. And if as a brand you need to build your own credibility and equity for your brand, then you just have to be true to what you're doing and communicate to the best of your ability. But it is a real challenge. I completely agree with you there. Can I just add one bit? So, sir, if I'm not wrong, your question was around that how do you measure the success? No, or the, it's about communicating. It's how are you going to communicate story. effectively? But if you look at PSUs, wonderful work they're doing. But they just speak on their websites. Uh, so, so let me uh, draw some ideas uh, the way I'm working. So, by the way, just for, uh, for my way of working in my organization, I don't have any KRs. There's no measure for me to define. <laughs> Nobody can come say that you're successful or you're a failure. There's no KRF. <laughs> um, and the reason why is it because I believe if you put a number, then I'm going to restrict myself to just achieve that number. I don't want to do that. I want to try something different. Being a very curious person, I want to try, experiment, fail and then do it. So one way, uh, when I was talking to my CEO and he said, uh, Iman, you don't have KRAs. How are you going to track you, your success and everything? So then my another co-founder, Varun, he came up and said, um, I think his success will speak when a third party comes in and says, hey guys, I've heard Bazi Games is doing good. You know, that's the ultimate win. And now to make sure that happens, let him do whatever he wants to do it. As long as he's following everything ethical, right way, consistent, let it do. So what I'm trying to say is, third party, people are going out talking about it, that hey, something is happening, do that. Now you use a traditional set of PR, a traditional set of media, digital media to communicate effectively and I believe that all my 
you know, team members. Uh, we have a small organization, around 400 people. And all of them, I truly believe, are brand ambassadors. So let's utilize the power of each and every individual and figure out what they really like and try to push those ideas over there. Let them also communicate effectively. And it's working, sir. It's working brilliantly. So I see that, you know, uh, another way to communicate what you're doing is you have your team members, let them understand that they are part of a big puzzle. If one piece is missing, the puzzle will not be completed. So they need to understand the value they're adding it and push them, motivate them, as, you know, appreciate what they're doing and use your internal communication for that. And then once the third party sees it, they start coming and talking that, hey, oh, we noticed this. Consciously, subconsciously, they realized it. And that's one way to, you know, figure it out. And this is coming from another brand that I really love. Um, I don't know if people are aware of it. A uh, brand called Nike. Anyone aware of it? Oh. Yeah, yeah, oh. I think it's safe to say that. Not it. bad, I'm impressed. So Nike, can anybody tell me the uh, slogan of Nike? Just. Uh, just remove the just, remove the it. Focus on do. Do. Just do. And you see the result will come in. Be consistent. You know, don't don't just focus on one set of communication. Leverage all of those possibilities. Uh, embrace AI, you know, but only as a as something that supports you, not going to drive you. Okay, so so use all of those things. Uh, bring in VR, AR. That's what we're trying to do for gaming industry. People who are differently abled, imagine what you know the possibilities we can explore with things like VR, AR, AI coming together. So we are working on that, being a part of this, you know, when I say we are building a whole gaming ecosystem, that's what we are trying to do. So yeah, I hope. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, just a quick point. Um, you know, I feel that your question is limiting because it limits itself to communication and I feel, I know that the theme is reputation, but I do want to drive on the point that there is a lot that happens before you communicate, right? I mean, hospitality being this, a lot of uh, sustainable products that you keep in the room, in the hotel, and then ultimately you communicate. So communication is actually the last step. It's the probably the most important step, one of the most important steps, but it's not the only step, right? Um, we launched a white paper yesterday on Radha in Indonesia around why ESG matters for the medtech industry, right? Uh, we inter interviewed 120 companies, 800 executives did a survey, right? And this is exactly what the entire report is talking about, right? So as an industry, what do we need to do? Right from <coughs> rethinking the products, the Apple example I gave in terms of redesigning, how to move that up into the supply chain, how to get our supply chain better, how to manufacture better, reducing carbon print, how to refurbish our products better, how to go get governments to endorse uh, products that are more in environmentally conscious while procuring, right? And get the technology right because you can't you can't mess with the technology when it comes to patients, right? Environmentally conscious cannot take away the safety aspect. That's that's a, that's not even an area which is debatable for us. Now, once you do all of this, that's when you have communications. So I just wanted to give that context. That that journey is very important, and only when we are authentic to that journey will we be authentic to the communication. I'm going to feed off everything that everybody has just said and uh, I, I love the sort of uh, metaphor of a jigsaw puzzle, right? And if I can just extend that metaphor a little bit, all of industry, coming back to Rajiv's point, all of the entire economic <coughs> ecosystem is also a patchwork quilt. You have B2B, B2C, you have PSUs who are doing a lot of work. Now, this patchwork quilt will have its own sort of diverse segments. And Rajiv, it's been two years now since SEBI made sustainability reporting mandatory for the top 100 listed companies. It's as much a part of your compliance as financial reporting. Two years. But to quote my young Gen Z students, real talk, how has India Inc. actually been doing on the ground in terms of transparent reporting? what has happened in last two years has uh, one is that it has been mandatory for under 500 and 1000 so they have to do it anyway but having said that what my friend said here there's a basic of work that precedes the reporting <coughs> right. 
So that is happening. The bigger companies are doing it better, definitely. The guys who are exporting, they have to do it because now carbon tax is also coming to play. So they're doing it. Now the challenge is what came across is that the challenge is in India is uh, SMEs comprise the largest chunk of the companies. Now these guys have multiple challenges. They have challenges financial, technical, <coughs> and also they don't have bandwidth to do this. Now the ones out of them which are aligned with the MNCs who have a global interest in business, they are getting a bit of capacity building, training, a bit of support also. And those are the guys who are the first ones to be aligned with it. And SMEs per se doesn't mean only smaller, round the, uh, round the corner shops. SMEs can be big also. So those guys are getting aligned. They have to do it mandatorily because they're in the exports essentially as part of the supply chain. I was really happy to know that, okay, uh, our friends from Leela are really looking at women-centric enterprises, which may be smaller, but they feed into the supply chain at the end of the day. So those are very important, which those are happening as has as come across. It's a very evolving kind of a domain. Everybody is learning and also it's getting fine-tuned also. So it's very difficult for everybody to keep pace with it. And also it's like what uh, the take time and government is conscious of it. Government is putting lots of efforts, uh, CDB is putting lots of efforts here and also uh, the associations are putting some effort here. So it's a matter of time only, we have to do it and one thing is non-negotiable is to be done and how fast the ones would be doing would depend upon whosoever is aligned with the global chain. And reporting is a bit of a challenge because reporting is also evolving, changing constantly. Right. But having said that if the basic work is there, there, it's only a question of data points at the end of the day. And there are lots of uh, E2s which are coming up which will help them to keep dynamically aligned with the global emerging framework also. If their work is in place, it's not going to be difficult to keep on realigning and aligning with the evolving formats. It's a challenge. It takes time, effort, resources. But it's to be done. And it's a constant work in progress. It's a, constant, it's a work in progress and going for years actually. It will be. I mean, it decades actually. Absolutely. If so we are to leave a planet. Would be there, it may change again. You never know. So it's a changing world. Because our environment challenges would also be evolving at the same time. Now, one of the things that's really, really coming out very clearly from all of the insights, and it's actually very heartening for all of us to listen to, is the fact that a lot of this change is also being driven by our guests, by our consumers. Now, I this is a question which is going out to everybody on the panel, actually. Please feel free to share your insights. One of the things which I think one of the biggest opportunities and challenges for us as brand builders, as communicators, is the challenge of multi-generational marketing. Now, in the luxury segment, in the gaming segment, across industries, we find that there are these multi-generational consumer groups and the needs and the demands of my young friends in the Gen Z to all the way to the baby boomers, which would be my parents' generation, are very, very diverse. At the same time, all of them are very, very key audiences for us. How then, especially considering that from awareness building, right till providing them the responsible products and services that they're looking for and their varying definitions of what constitutes responsibility, how do we reach out to these very, very diverse audiences and how can that possibly help us turn maybe a brand agnostic guest into a brand evangelist? This is open for the panel. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> So um, I think multi uh, communicating to an audience which is a multi-generational audience, whether it is for ESG or for any other initiative that you launch are not very different. Um, I think the millennials today, uh, you talk about Gen Z, you talk about Gen Alpha, uh, for them probably sustainability, planet, these are more, these topics resonate more than a baby boomer like myself for whom probably it was more about social impact. Uh, those are the subtle nuances of what matters to whom. But I think at the end of the day, everything matters to everybody. I think it's also very encouraging to see that, uh, and I can give you a real life example on this. 
Uh, in my previous role, uh, we had a very senior executive, a global executive, who traveled to my region, and I was looking after Africa. And she went to Nairobi, and she went said to me that, um, you know, can you curate an itinerary for me? I want to go and spend time uh, with the Maasai and my children. And she had two children, age 13 and 18. They want to volunteer for a week and work with the Maasai. So we organized something for her and she, instead of spending one week, landed up spending two weeks. For one week she worked out of Nairobi while her, her children uh, volunteered. She came back from that experience and she said that, um, I want to partner with this organization on a global level and give this to my guests so that they can volunteer and donate their points, their loyalty points to support that charity. And it was a very nondescript, small little charity which was running about five schools only in Nairobi. And for an international brand uh, which had a global footprint, I was like, how is this even going to resonate across continents? Because if I'm an Indian, I have enough opportunities to donate to a charity here in India and make a meaningful difference to my immediate environment, why would I want to go and donate in Africa? But you'd be surprised that when we launched this, the amount of uh, interest we got and the amount of collections we were able to receive in the very first year of launch. And that's what makes you think that these are all real uh, situations which resonate with everyone globally, irrespective of age, irrespective of gender, irrespective of who you are and where you live and what you do. And related to that is also uh, the way that you communicate, the channels that you use to communicate. And again, this is not specific to only ESG. I think, um, again, you know, Gen Z, millennials, Gen Alpha, more social media savvy, whereas a person like me who's a baby boomer, for me, I'm an experimental Instagrammer. I keep testing the waters, I go deeper, then I message my son or my daughter in law or my daughter and say, how do I tag the story or how do I make it more relevant? So I struggle at times that, but these are real challenges. This is just who we are as people. So I think it's also trying to be able to use the right channel of communication to reach the audience so that you are able to connect with them. I think how uh, people today interact with brands based on which segment you fall into is different. People today want to communicate or interact with brands in their own time and in their own space. And as brands, we need to be able to understand that and be present everywhere. Uh, but be present selectively with the right message at the right times and give the opportunity to your target audience to be able to connect with you. I'll take one more minute and explain to you one example that we uh, we did. So we launched um, our in-house water bottling plant. We were launching net zero, uh, zero waste menus. And we were talking about our new range of bath amenities that comes in 100% recyclable packaging blah 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 and I said okay a press release you can send out you can do some test drops we thought of all the innovative ways that us as comms people use um, and then um, I said well how is my younger audience that age group of 24 to 34 going to connect with this and how do I get across to them and I realized possibly music and I said, okay, what do we do in music? So we identified Ricky Cage, a three-time Grammy Award winner, um, who is also the uh, UN uh, Goodwill Ambassador for Sustainability. Uh, and he creates music, which helps build awareness for social impact. Uh, we partnered with him and we created a four-city series called Rhythm of the Earth. Uh, where he's got these beautiful immersive visuals. He works with refugees on stage to create music. Uh, and we launched all three of these touch points. The menu was zero waste menu. We had our, or just our water bottles, which were our glass water bottles. We did a whole installation of those water bottles. And suddenly we found so much of this finding its way on social media. A lot of media, traditional media picked it up because collaboration 
gives you another way of amplifying your message and building that awareness which otherwise you may not have been able to get if you were to choose only traditional media. Um, I, I would just like to say that I think um, if you try too hard on ESG communications to be multi-audience um, uh, or very specific on a niche, Gen Z, baby boomers, whatever, I think as an organization, you risk the, the aspect of trying too hard. Uh, I think ESG cuts across those uh, demographics because it's just so important from a planet and environment perspective. Um, and I think if companies try to hard, they can be seen as a bit disingenuous about what they're really trying to do. They're trying to overtly gain or profit from this, right? Uh, and that's when things like greenwashing, you know, come along with the likes of uh, Nestle, you know, where they have pledged that they will reduce, uh, you know, um, single-use plastic waste, but they really haven't. Uh, or uh, Volkswagen, you know, which had issues with uh, um, pollution and emissions, where they tinkered with those um, software on their cars. Uh, and again, I think they were just probably trying too hard to appease a very wider, uh, you know, constituent and uh, industry or, uh, or customers. So I don't think. Uh, ESG is about being cool. I, I, I don't think it's about segmented marketing. I, I think it's just something that needs to work for everybody. Yeah. And I think there are multiple brands who are doing this the right way, right? I mean, if you look at brands like uh, uh, H&M today, uh, they have a very unique fabric uh, recycling uh, uh, technology that they've invented. Uh, you know, Puma, for example, uh, sources 80% of the cotton from, you know, uh, uh, sustainable means. Uh, and there are a million examples of you know brands doing that right, uh, and I think that message you know I think uh, uh, is 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 uh, strong enough for everybody to buy into that product, whether you're young or old, <laughs> is my contrarian view on that. Okay, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, no, I go after you. Yeah. I think one of the simpler ways of approaching this is multi generation, as you said. Is look at your family essentially, probably parents, children, and yourself. And I would look at the language part of it, the usage of words, carbon budget, carbon space. These are not words that <coughs> easily resonate with people. Yeah. So probably simplify it into understandable language which people can relate to. It's not very difficult. So it's, it only needs a bit of uh, simplification. And of course, the, the future generation may be uh, looking for really the technical words. Those could be at, uh, at later on. But essentially, we need to relate to understandable language, which could, which could be water, which could be warming rather than emissions, which could be about prob probably pollution rather than uh, carbon, sulfur and uh, other uh, other ingredients. So I think that is a very simpler and easier way of probably communicating to different generations at the same time. Not very different thing. And Absolutely. I mean, this uh, keep it simple. That is a basic principle we seem to forget. And, you know, thank you for bringing us back to that because absolutely, Brevity is the soul of wit, simplicity is the soul of elegance, absolutely. Adi, if you wanted to say something. I just, uh, you know, so I wanted to go last in this question because I thought it's a really nice question, right? Multi-generational audience. But I wanted to pick up on the word audience, right? Because multi-generational is, of course, one way to look at it. But then who, ESG communication is for what audience? And that is where the nuance comes. Right? Mm -hmm. So as a corporation, my audience are the policy makers, which is the government. They're my own employees, right? Um, they're consumers and they're pressure groups, right? By pressure groups, I mean think tanks, activists, right? And you can't use the same message for everyone, right? Uh, the government just wants to know from a statutory perspective. Employees need to know that am I in an organization which means what it says? Consumers at this point of time at least want to be reassured that you're making an effort. You're bringing in those subtle changes that I see, fans like me now, uh, you know, subtle do more changes. And pressure groups want to know, are you full of crap? Because a lot of them are being washing, right? Uh, so when we speak of audiences, we need to be very careful who we are communicating to, right? And I'll just give an example. A few years back, uh, ago, a company came to me and said, and this is one of it had manufacturing plants all over India. And they said, Adip, can you help us communicate to the government that we are 50-50 now, 50-50 in terms of diversity, right? So 
women workers and by the way it's, that's fantastic right because it's easier to have more females in the boardroom but it's very tough to have them on the shop floor where manufacturing is happening and most of these factories are located outside of major towns right brilliant stuff that you're doing how does it matter to the government is what i told them so you have to it matters to consumers it does matter i do think it makes a different you know, difference if a consumer knows that this company promotes equality not only in terms of uh, diversity in terms of female population but also lgbtq persons with disabilities something that we all miss out on on all the time right i think it's fantastic and i would certainly pay a premium for that uh, but again not everything that you do in eag needs to be communicated to not everybody you need to segment it in terms of audience and in terms of multi generational audiences thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and for a very very fruitful engaging discussion i think what we can all take away from this is we are living in a more aware world we are living in a more conscious world but it is about building communities as well i'm just going to take 2 minutes to check if we have any questions from our audience yes hello <laughs> Good to know that they're actually up and listening. So. <laughs> um, good morning to sorry, good afternoon. My bad. Uh, my name is Manya Kathyan. I am a semester one student, and I have a couple of questions, as everyone is already aware. Um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Tripathi, I have two questions for you. I have one question to the entire panel, and Mr. Puri, I have two questions for you. If I'm, I'm during the entire discussion, I just was on my phone. I was noting down a lot of. I just hope somebody else also has questions. They're going to start. Yes. Okay. Last one, Shani. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Tripathi, I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned that sustainability is the new cool. But is it right to believe or anticipate that soon this trend of becoming sustainable or this desire to be sustainable for the aesthetic is going to turn into a is going to turn into a fad because you see in the current generation there are a lot of nihilists now nietzsche was a, it's a brilliant philosophy to follow if it's followed correctly which is which it is not at the current moment so how do you propose we can make our generation and the generation beyond a care beyond the three month trend thank you so when i say that it's a new cool i am not trying to relate this with a trend because the moment you start thinking that uh, all csr initiative esg related ideas are trends then i think it's it's not going to solve the purpose the idea when i say cool is that people can relate people can find it easy people can find it that it suits my lifestyle and we have this elevated thinking and the brand is also doing something so let's be more responsible that way um to get rid of this idea if i if i'm able to get your uh, question correctly that uh, how are we going to ensure that this does not become like a facade or a fake thing that we're trying to do or as i say green washing and all of it um we need to change certain things i'll give you an example um uh, if i'm not wrong there are more than 100 unicorns that we have in india right now out of that there are only 3 unicorns from the gaming industry dream 11 mpl and if i'm not wrong games craft only 3 gaming industry part of unicorn now this whole word unicorn is very interesting uh, i currently if you look at the definition of it i don't believe in it i don't believe you all the unicorns are there there now why i don't believe because the moment you get the fund you reach a valuation of 1 billion dollar and you can call yourself a unicorn what's what's the point of being responsible what's the point of you know being profitable what's the point of thinking at the macro level that i mentioned you know thinking about the environment where are those things can we create some matrix over there till the time you fulfill that in a genuine way where if i buy a third fourth fifth party you cannot become a unicorn just one example of doing these things um, so when i said let me let me confirm that idea of being cool is not to be trendy okay cool is i think a bigger definition the intention was to just relate to that part so i hope i answered your question and you said you have another question for me 
I would just like to address Manya's question very briefly. Manya, very briefly, you, address, uh, you spoke about Nietzsche. He proclaimed God to be dead several decades ago, right? Uh, for those who believe God is still around, but the planet, unfortunately, is dying. So the new cool and the old cool is making sure that we keep our cool and don't let the polarized caps melt anymore. Um, I'll continue with my questions. Mr. Puri, I have two for you. Uh, we mentioned standardization as being necessary to meet ESG goals. Is a strict standardization the best way to conduct these ESG goals? If there are levels to how much a brand can contribute? And you know, there is also another factor. How does a business be, uh, let's say, sustainable, uh, provide to the environment, be, be what it has to be? Uh, to the extent that it does not overextend itself or, you know, as a business fail, because there are a lot of places, a lot of brands and businesses who, who were in the womb, who did, who wanted to contribute but could not because they overexerted themselves. Second, I wanted to ask, you know, taking an example from the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, like India has with relation to carbon emissions and how much they contribute. Uh, is it? Uh, I wanted to ask the necessary bare minimum for standardiz standardization of ECG. It is based on whose perspective? Thank you. No, I think um, when we speak of standardization, um, I think what you're alluding to is how much is too much, who, who really sets the standard, right? Uh, thankfully, you're defining it in my KIA, right? Uh, I help companies come together and develop consensus of what that standard should be. We then work, the, work with the government to actually get that standard, right? It's co-creation. Um, and the second part of what you said, um, there could be companies which are overextending, which means over sort of over the threshold of the standard, which is fantastic, by the way, or the companies which are below. I think SMEs, startups could be below, not because they're not that ambitious, but because uh, they're still trying to grow to that level, right? Business exigencies, profit maximization takes precedent. Sustenance takes precedence, right? Um, but you need to have a standard. You need to have a feedback loop on that standard because these standards are going to be around for decades, years, right? Um, not everything needs to be standardized. Voluntary uh, measures in this case certainly need to be encouraged. They are sp specifically encouraged in new uh, cases in industries like gaming um, and new innovations, right? Uh, so that's loosely what the answer is, right? I don't think there should be a standard dictum always, but then you do need to have something to aspire to towards, right? I hope that answers. It does, sir. Uh, and this is my final question, then I will leave you alone. I promise. <laughs> I'll hand it over to Gaurav, sir. Um, this is a question to the general panel. Current generations, my generation and my mother's generation, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to say old, so I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Current generations and beyond are acutely suspicious of brands that preach but do not practice, of course, greenwashing and uh, beyond that. However, transparency, as it has been mentioned inside of this uh, panel discussion, is extremely vital. And I do believe that. But sometimes it's not possible for every brand to be 100% transparent with what they do, or sometimes they do not want to. But how does a provider or a brand owner balance this factor? Because transparency is vital, but it's not always the best move for you as a company, but it is the best move for you if you're wanting to be sustainable. Thank you. I mean, I could try to answer that. But uh, no, I mean, I think uh, uh, transparency is really important. I think as you mentioned earlier that um, the only way that you can be seen as uh, authentic and meaningful is that if you're transparent. And I think in today's environment where um, you know there's so much of uh, social media empowerment, everybody has a view, you can tweet, you can blog, you can do whatever you like, right? So I don't think reputable brands can afford to uh, you know, uh, endanger their uh, brand reputation by not being transparent. So I think being transparent is not a choice. Um, I think having said that, uh, there's some interesting facts on the, you know, on, on why communicating transparently is a bit more important is because there's a bit of a dichotomy. Um, there was a survey in the UK and I forget the organization and I don't know the specific numbers, but 
the dichotomies of the fact that half the people don't understand, you know, uh, what being sustainable means and what terms means for, you know, like when they buy a product, if they buy a shampoo, for example, and whatever it says in the back, you know, we're recyclable and, you know, carbon neutral and blah, blah, blah. Half the audience don't even know what that means, right? Uh, half of them have a very healthy distrust for what companies claim that they're doing from a, a sustainability uh, perspective. And some half of them uh, actually uh, expect more out of companies, right? So it's, it's a little all over the place. So the point I want to make is that uh, in that kind of a setting, it's even more important on marketing communications of folks like us to uh, be even more transparent. The responsibility lies on us even more so because if, if, if consumers are blindly believing what a brand is saying about ESG, then it's, it's on us to communicate that effectively and truthfully and transparently, right? Because that responsibility lies on brand marketing and communications in today's age of ESG and reputation management. So that's, that's how I would respond to your question. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> We have time for one final question. Gaurav. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, such a beautiful discussion. And I'm uh, glad to be a part of it. Uh, I serve as a facilitator here. And ESG is built into the uh, subject that I teach called facility management. And semester five students are here. And they've been through the ESG reports of companies like Lemon Tree, Infosys, uh, Unilever and many other FMCG companies uh, and they are a long read, very very difficult to comprehend. So we try and uh, keep them simple in a classroom discussion. Uh, glad that you could uh, come up with so many terms that I am sure my students uh, have related to by now. My question to you is that uh, ESG still uh, seen not as, uh, it's a mature concept but it is still relatively new uh, for a lot of industries. Is government, especially in India, are, are they um, have they been able to set standards in advance for companies to follow, or is it the companies like Mr. Adi Puri just mentioned that they come, uh, they do a, they have a collective uh, approach towards setting standards? Is government acing it? Are they ahead of the game, or they are following what industry is telling them? Standards are set by government and the crew comes essentially from investors globally. That's what drives EHG essentially. And the standards are set by the multi stakeholder kind of a effort where you have financial institutions, you have an RBI governors, so worldwide central bank governors, you also have companies and others and experts also coming on board to do this. That's why it's happening. And the other thing is that what you, uh, what you ask for is that are the, uh, is the government ahead of a uh, Government is not ahead. Government is only trying to get the system in place so that companies are competitive globally at least to begin with. And then of course you come to sustainability bit and other things, but it's essentially a business driven kind of a concept. It's not a mature one, it's evolving yet, it's pretty young actually. So it's evolving and government is also learning and SETI has stepped in very proactively here and which is commendable actually and they have been really taking it up in a gradual manner. You had 100 companies first, then 500, then 1000. You had voluntary disclosures, now there are uh, third party assessments happening here. So, they are also trying to get in people, companies on board gradually, but in a time bound kind of a manner. And there is a feedback mechanism and standards are not common for all. There are what, sector, uh, there is a sector wise standard. So, what may apply to hospitality doesn't apply to a power plant. So, there is a differentiation also there. So, those things are being factored in very well. Then within that, of course, uh, probably uh, uh, social may apply more to hospitality and E may apply to more hospitality, but E doesn't apply to, for example, uh, a, a company which doesn't have say banking, for example, as much as it applies to hospitality or to power plants. So those factors are also being, in terms, they're also being, uh, I would say that they're also being factored in and given assigned proper value. Governance is common to most of them. So that's how it is working out. Very good. Thank you. Much, uh, sort of said, and, it, and that's what I just want to echo that top down definitely said he's doing great work, but it really comes to the sectors and products. 
everybody has their own journey, right? Power plants, energy, technology, healthcare, they all need to have their own journey and <coughs> all of those journeys will be different. Same would be the case of multinationals based in India, domestic, SMEs, unorganized sector. So it's, it's fragmented, jigsaw puzzle, right? That's what we spoke about in the, in the beginning. So. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but our wonderful speakers are here for a while for you to catch up with later on. Please, can we have a round of applause for the insight?